everyone will come on up to the carpet and let's get into the presence of God tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you are ready to worship? How many of you have a God and you have something to be thankful for? So we're going to take a moment and we're going to exercise our prayer language in song. So Jonathan's going to play. Just right where you're standing, just close your eyes. Just close your eyes. No one's around you. Nobody can hear you. Nobody cares what you sound like. And just begin to sing in the Spirit. And here's what that sounds like. Get your voices up a little louder. That's okay. Rivers of living water, just let them flow right now.
belong. Sing it.
say, Miss Pomeroy? Come here, brother. Just keep worshiping right there. Know that I am the Lord your God. When you walk through the valleys, I will be with you. And the fires, they'll not burn you. All you need to do is just look to me. I am he that calls the storms to cease. I am he who causes the fire not to burn. I am the Lord your God. I have sealed you with my presence. I have sealed you with my blood. Look to me. Look to me. I am the Lord God that causes things to be not as though they were. I am the God that causes the impossible to be possible. All you need to do is just reach out and look to me. Grab hold of the train that fills the temple. Grab hold of my glory. Grab hold of all that I am. real quick some of you came in with chains I felt I felt I heard rattling when you walked in not I don't know who in particular I just felt like there's a heaviness so and I know some of it's probably because you sat in traffic and probably had a boss scream at you before you leave I don't know what happened but but right now just take your hands and just shake it off shake it off right now just shake it off It's okay. It doesn't matter what happened. All that matters is the King of Glory is here right now. Speak after me. I declare and I decree an open heaven. I speak to principalities. I speak to darkness. I speak to wickedness. I speak to the heavenlies. And I command you by the authority of Jesus Christ that this is a demon-free zone. 
no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I stand victorious. I declare and decree and open heaven over this place. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. So everybody gather around Deacon Lisa. As you can tell who the victim's going to be, not the victim, but the, the lucky, blessed minister to, for the night. Years ago, we said, I said, I gave a prophecy in this church. Two things that are, that are lacking in this church is people are poverty, mind-stricken, and lack of grace. And um, I've noticed people have gotten out of the poverty mindset, and I'm noticing that the grace is being extended in this environment. And right now, Deacon Lisa's going to talk about it. Um, Pastor Joe, would you pray? Father God, we thank you for Deacon Lisa. We thank you, God, that she hears your voice clearly, and she'll speak forth your words with power and might that it will hit the mark, open our ears to hear, and open our hearts to receive all that you have for us tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. have a helper here for just one second to hand out some paperwork just give everybody one of those that would be great thank you so much and then later I'm going to hand out an index card for everybody do you have something to write with tonight does everybody have something to write with if you don't I've got a few pencils up here Uh, you can pass them out to everybody if you want to, but it will be for our activation later. Is everybody doing good tonight? Amen, amen. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. So well, tonight we're going to talk about grace. Grace. Grace is used for a lot of different things. Did you know that? You know, I'm just going to be frank with you all tonight about some stuff. Is that okay, too? I'm going to be truthful and honest and loving, all right? In a loving way. No, it's not that bad, okay? I promise you. I'm not going to beat better and bruise you tonight. But there are some things that will probably... I will say that will probably help you sit up and take note. And so that's why I want you to take some notes tonight, okay? So grace is used for lots of different things. Um, we have uh, grace periods. As you know, in the workplace, you have grace periods to get some things done, right? We have grace periods in our lives. God grants us grace, right? We use grace before dinner. Everybody pray for their dinner, breakfast, and lunch. Amen. We uh, use it for greetings and salutations in the scriptures such as grace and peace be unto you, grace to you, uh, or even a benediction, grace be unto you. Uh, in some of Paul's letters, he greets and has a little benediction at the end sometimes when he writes his letters in the scriptures. So, um, you know, we don't do that now. Uh, Pastor Michael, grace be unto you brother and unto you right so we don't do that now but we do greet each other and so we are you know in a sense giving grace to one another when we are greeting one another okay so <clears throat> we also sing songs uh, I, I didn't make copies for everybody but we do have songs that we sing what is the most popular hymn ah okay amazing grace do you know who wrote it John Newton, who said that? Kevin, you said, oh, you said that, didn't you, Chris? Amen. John Newton, between 1700 and 1807, uh, and he was a captain, a captive, uh, captain of a boat uh, who was also a slave owner. So, Amazing Grace, and I'm sure everybody in here knows all the words to Amazing Grace, so I'm not going to read that verbatim to you, so I'm just going to set that aside, okay? But we've sang it, and we've sang it. That was the first um, hymn that I encountered when I was in the Southern Baptist Church when I was 10 years old. That was the first song that, um, 
besides the old rugged cross, of course, that helped me with my salvation at 10 years old. Now, there was a period of time after that where I didn't go to church because my parents weren't church church goers. But I remember that song every other Sunday or almost every Sunday. They would sing Amazing Grace. It would, it would pull at your heartstrings because it talked about God's amazing grace. And again, but I'm not going to read all that to you because you know the words. I don't have to explain those to you. But so we sing those songs. Um, we also sing a song here, How He Loves. Where's Janica? Janica, you built that out a lot. And, and one of the words, some, there's a sentence in there that says, if grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. I don't know. I just felt the Holy Ghost. I felt the Holy Ghost on that one. What does that mean? What does that truly mean to us when we say, if grace is an ocean, we're all sinking? Do you truly know what that means? It's immeasurable. Okay, immeasurable. There's no way that you can measure all the water in the ocean, is there? And there's a lot of percentage of water on the earth, right? But there's no definitive number that we could actually tag onto that to say that this number represents the grace that God gives us because there's no way that that is even in, in my textbook anywhere I don't have one so that's what I'm trying to get you to say it is it's immeasurable it's in for me it's indefinite it's always there and it's not measurable does that make sense to you so the next time you sing that line in that song how he loves how he loves if grace is an ocean we're all sinking it will have just a little bit more meaning to you the next time you sing it. Because I don't know about you, but grace is an awesome thing. And we're going to find that out tonight. We really are. Now, there's also a new song that if you haven't gone out to YouTube to see it uh, by Matt Redman, he is a Christian singer, and he has a new song out, okay, that talks about grace finds, your grace finds me. So it's a really beautiful song. So I'm going to give that sheet to Michael so he can just over look it over and, and uh, see some of the words on there. It's a beautiful song. Okay, so you might want to jot that down. All right, so we have songs. We say grace, uh, those kinds of things. But what I want to talk to you about tonight, well, one more thing before I move forward, is that we even have an acronym for grace. Did you know that? Yeah, there's an acronym for grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's a good way to remember the word grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. So there's lots of different things that tells us what we do with grace, how we talk about grace, uh, the things that help us to remember about grace. But do we really? Do we really know? Okay. Do we really grasp what grace really is? Can you sum grace up in one word? He did by immeasurable. Is there another word? Unmerited favor. Good, because that was in my notes too. I like that. Unfathomable. Unfathomable. I can't even say that word, but that's okay. You understand. Rich. Okay. Good. If, huh? Active. What? Scandalous. Okay, that's radical, but that's okay. It's radical. Grace is radical. Okay. All right, just so that you get a little information, here's the Greek word for grace. You might want to jot that down as well. Here's the Greek word for grace. It is charis. Charis means blessing and favor. Charis, blessing and favor. I did do a little homework so that you can understand where I'm coming from. All right, let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer this to me personally, or if you just want to raise your hand to agree, that's great. Um, uh, let me ask the question. Have you ever received a gift you didn't deserve? 
Yes, most of us have. Most of us have. The gift was given to you out of love and compassion, right? God is so great that he gives us his grace because of whose love? His love. That's why it's immeasurable. God gives us his grace because of his love to us. Okay. Grace is God showing his love to you even though you don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve God's grace just based on the past. And I'm not going to go into that tonight, but there's lots of things that some of you may know and some of you may not know based on my history. But I don't deserve it, but he gave it to me anyway. Okay? You cannot earn it. If you think you can earn it, you're wrong. I'll tell you that right now. You cannot earn it. It is a free gift that God gives you, period. End of sentence. Okay? You do not deserve to be saved from sin, but he did. And then when you received him into your heart, now you have the assurance of knowing that you have eternal life. True enough? If you're a born-again Christian, you understand that, right? Okay. That's what's so amazing, that no matter what I've done, where I've been, who I've hurt, what I've said or shouldn't have said, that God's grace is what? Sufficient for me. We'll get to that scripture in just a couple minutes. All right, God showed his grace by saving you from sin's punishment when you trusted in Jesus as Savior. God also shows his grace by giving you strength and guidance. When you're down to your... that I didn't have anything else to give, period, okay? But God showed his grace by saving you from sin's punishment when you trusted in Jesus as Savior. God also shows you his grace by giving you strength and guidance and taking care of you each and every day. God, by his grace, gives you strength to handle difficult problems in your life. I think that just hit home with a couple of folks. So God's grace is wonderful. That's the one word I didn't hear anybody say. God's grace is wonderful. It sets no boundaries. We set the boundaries. That's not in my notes. Oh, my goodness. Come on now, right? We don't sometimes allow ourselves to get beyond where we are because we set those boundaries. But grace helps us get beyond those boundaries to move to where God wants us to be. Amen? Okay. So if you know Jesus as your Savior, you can be thankful that God saved you by his grace. The Bible says... 
uh, in Ephesians 2, 8, if you want to turn there. Yeah, I think that's on your sheet too. But it says, for, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. That's a pretty common uh, scripture that we usually co- quote a lot. Besides, God's grace is sufficient, right? But there are others. That's why I wanted to give you that sheet tonight because there's lots of other scriptures in the in the New Testament where it talks about, and the Old Testament, but it, I like to refer to the New Testament a lot and the fact that we are then under the New Covenant. So there's lots of scriptures that refer to lots of different things that can be encouraging to you to give you hope and strength and, and, and reassurance with God's grace, okay? So it's not just those two scriptures, okay? All right, so Ephesians 2 eight says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. You can also depend on God each day for grace, and you need to live for him because God shows his grace to you, and you should show his grace to others. How do we do that? How do we show grace to others? Can you get a mic, another mic for me? Thank you. Forgive them when they don't deserve to be forgiven? Yes. That's the way I felt. That's the way I felt. I've done some pretty gnarly things in my life. The person that you see up here is not the person that I used to be. But because of grace, I am a new creature in in, in Jesus Christ, right? Amen? So what is another way? Is that the only way? How do we show grace to others? Generosity? Absolutely. Absolutely. You remember the, the movie Pay It Forward? Absolutely. Well, let me tell you a story. Uh, my spouse and I went to lunch yesterday. Uh, I told this uh, story to Jenny a little while ago about the fact that uh, we went to a place where they serve hash browns. You might know where that might be. And uh, I think we forgot that they didn't take a debit card, you know. And uh, she went to pay for the lunch, and they wouldn't take the card, okay. And guess what? The man sitting right next to uh, the cash register, he said, I got it, hon. I'll buy y'all's lunch. No problem. Was that grace? Yes, it was. And she says, what can I do to repay you? He said, absolutely nothing. But the only thing that I do ask you to do is if you, that you show that and give that to someone else, that you don't keep it, that you do that for someone else. That is grace, right? I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. You know, there's a thing where you went through the Chick-fil-A line and you bought the person's lunch behind you. So that is, that is part of grace, showing hospitality. Right. So there are different many ways. You can also depend on God each day for the grace you need to live for him because he shows you his grace. So, what about compassion? Is that a form of grace? If I do not have compassion for you, then I'm not displaying grace. What about forgiveness? Ouch, ouch, right? Forgiveness is always a big one. There was a particular incident in my life that I held on to for 25 years. For me, it was a big one, okay? But it wasn't until I got to New Covenant that I could release that. Am I been set free for that? Has God's grace landed on me? Absolutely, yes. So forgiveness is part of God's grace. So we have a tendency to hang on to things that we should be letting go. And I'm pe- preaching to the choir because I've done that. I've done that. And I'm so glad. What'd you say? Okay. <laughs> I love you. I love you. But, but, again, we have a tendency to hang on to those things where God can release them and we can have the, that freedom in our life to move forward Just because of his grace. Amen? Praying for other people, our prayers, is part of grace. 
pray for those that have harmed you. Pray for those that have condemned you. Pray for those that have made you feel less than. You still have to give them grace. You know, some of the churches that I came from that said you would never amount to anything because you are a lesbian. You know, we teach the right doctrine. Don't do it. Don't go. But I did. And I had to move forward. But then I had to forgive them. And then I had to apply grace. And then I had to keep going and going and going until I got that freedom in my heart that God gives me every moment of my life. Every moment. It's tough sometimes to do that. I will admit, I'll be the first one to admit that it is tough to pray for those that have hurt you. But I guarantee you, you'll have so much freedom by the time you land on your face and give it to God, you won't know what to do. You'll be jumping around and running. Woo! Hallelujah, right? All right. What about love? <laughs> wow. Harmonious. Hmm. We're to love our brothers and sisters as much as we are to pray for them, forgive them, and have compassion for them. Love is all sweet and fuzzy in new relationships. That's great. But we're talking about the bigger picture. We're talking about the immeasurable amount of love and grace that God gives us each and every day to be able to do what God expects of us in order to move and do and say, preach, teach, and go out of the country for those that have less than what we do. Okay? Sometimes we take that for granted Think about that for just a second. We go through our everyday busy life. We work. We play. We sleep. We eat. We do it all over again the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And next thing you know, it's 365 days, and the year is gone. Okay? What I'm trying to get you to think here is that When is the last time that you thank God for his immeasurable grace? When I started this study and I told Pastor Michael and Pastor Randy that I wanted to teach on grace, I had a lot of things going on, okay? Had a lot of things going on in my head. Again, I'm not preaching... I'm preaching to the choir because when God gives you a word, he stirs up things in your life that you will have to work on. So when I got that word with that, do do you take it for granted, Lisa? I go, well, Lord, I don't think I do, but oh, my gosh, when was the last time I said, God, thank you. Thank you so much for your love, your grace, and your mercy that you give me each and every day. If it wasn't for your grace and mercy, I would not be here today. If it wasn't for your grace and mercy, I would not have food on my table. I would not have a spouse. I would not have a new home. I would not have a car. I would not have any of that because of God's grace and God's mercy. Now, what's the difference between grace and mercy since we're on that. Tana. Grace is God's unmerited gift to you, something that you do not deserve that you're getting. Mercy is God not giving you what you deserve. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mercy withholds the punishment that we deserve. But grace gives us a blessing that we don't deserve. God shows both grace, mercy and grace, but they are not the same. Mercy, mercy withholds a punishment we deserve. Grace gives a blessing that we don't deserve. So when Jesus went to the cross, that's where the 
we talk about the mercy seat. Okay? God was um, put on the cross, beaten, battered, and bruised, and that's where mercy comes in. Okay? Grace comes in knowing that we are human. We don't deserve anything, but because of his unmerited, unmeasurable love for us, he still gives us the blessings through his grace. Right? As Pastor Randy would say, are you tracking with me? <laughs> All right, consider this example. Let me just read this to you so you can kind of give a, and this is a cute example. It says, uh, if you were stopped in, in, in your old clunker of a car going 60 miles an hour in a school zone, and the ticket's too high, and you can't pay for it, and you appear before the judge with nothing to say for yourself or for your defense. The judge hears your case, and then, to your surprise, he cancels the fine. He just decides to cancel the fine. This is mercy. But the judge doesn't stop there. He walks outside and hands you the keys to a new car. That's grace. Right? So you get the picture? All right. Good deal. <laughs> grace is God giving the greatest treasure, the greatest treasure to the least deserving. Which, by the way, is everybody in this room, Amen. including myself, including those that will hear this message in the future. You cannot earn God's grace. Why? Because it's already been given. Right? Because it's already been given. Because God gives us to us freely. When we were in sin, God gave us his grace when he saved us so we can have eternal life rather than reap the sin's punishment. So thankful for that. Absolutely thankful for that. Amen? All right, um, go to Second Corinthians 12, 9. And this is the most popular scripture, I think, everybody. You've already said it once. If you're there, say amen. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Okay, thank you. It says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfect in weakness. That holds a lot of water. That is a promise to you. That is a definite promise to you to remember that no matter what is going on, the circumstances in your life, that God's grace is sufficient. Bar none, as they say. Right? Okay. Now, here's the fun part. However, grace does not excuse sin. That's a hard word to hear, I know. Okay? I'll be the first one to tell you that. I've, again, had some gnarly stuff in my life. And when I was a Christian, I still did gnarly stuff until I got it right. But I had to go back and repent. God's grace is still sufficient for the things that I did. But it's still no excuse to continue down the same track. You understand what I'm saying? If I offended Charlene, and I know I offended Charlene, what am I supposed to do? Go to Charlene and say, Sister, I am so sorry for what I just did. I still have grace, right? But it's my job to go to her and say, I am so, so sorry. Right? Regardless of the fact you just said you forgave me, she may not. But I still have to apply that grace. Right? Right? In other words, you've heard the saying, thank God for grace because he or she is not living right. Ah, you know, so-and-so over there. Thank God we got grace. They just ain't doing it right. You heard that, right? 
gosh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. But it doesn't excuse the sin. God doesn't like the sin, but he loves the sinner. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Amen. As Christians, we should not sin just because grace is in abundance. That's a tough sentence to chew on. As Christians, we should not sin just because grace is in abundance. Yes, we are human. Yes, we will stray. But knowingly doing something and knowing it is sin is not a good thing. Now, again, if I go back to the story where I hurt Charlene in some way or form or fashion, and then I go back and I do it again, and then I go back and I do it again, what am I doing? I'm still sinning, right? Repeatedly. God's grace is still there, but I still have to apply that grace and do my part in order for grace to be what? Applied. Correct. Applied. Do we have to die daily? Yes, we do. We have to go before God and die daily so that his grace will remain sufficient in our lives. Daily. We have to repent for the things that we knowingly have done, but what about the things that we, that we don't know that we've done? Aggression, uh, what do you call them? It's transgressions. Right, transgressions. So we have to bring them before God too. Because I don't know, you know, I might have said something, it may come out the wrong way, but someone else may have taken it a different way. And I have no idea that I hurt someone. You know, I think it was earlier, uh, Rolanda said, I didn't get a hug from you. And by the way, I'm so sorry, because when I came in here, I had a one-track mind. I was getting ready for this, and I apologize. Do you accept my apology? Thank you. Grace applied. So you see the point? Even when we don't knowingly know that we've done something, we still have to ask for forgiveness for that. Okay, I need someone to read uh, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Volunteer. Paul's in Ephesus, and he's writing letters. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. Look at verse 9. It is not by works that you receive grace. No matter what you say or do, it's still a free gift. You don't have to do anything to get it. You don't have to do somersaults. You don't have to be the most profound preacher, teacher, evangelist, or prophet. It's still there, so you don't have to do anything to receive it. And you don't have to boast about it either. <laughs> you notice I'm smiling about that? There are, there are people in the world that boast about that, you know. But I'm not going to name names and take numbers and all that kind of good stuff and Facebook them, okay? <laughs> now look at the very last sentence of the very last verse. It says, which God prepared in advance for us. He already knew that grace needed to be applied to us humans. Already knew it in advance, prepared the whole package. The whole package. Okay? Turn to Ephesians 4, 7. And volunteer for that one.
that grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's, Christ's gift. Hmm. I like the part where it says Christ apportioned it. He has given you an immeasurable amount of grace, whether you realize it or not. Whether you realize it or not. Remember I was telling you earlier that there were some things that I had to take some check marks and think about and, you know, some things resurfaced. And I had to remember that I have enough grace that God has given me. He has apportioned it to me. Now it's my job to make sure it gets out there. Okay, we're going to back up just a little bit and go to Ephesians 3, 1 through 13. I'll read this for you. For this reason, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus, of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that it is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I already written briefly. I want you to underline the word mystery. Isn't it a mystery, God's grace? That's another word you can remember about grace. We cannot fathom. So the scripture says they called it a mystery. In reading this, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has been revealed by the Spirit of God, holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So, if you have grace, you are an heir. You have that promise as one body. I became a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his, what? Power. When you receive grace, you receive power. That's something else I forgot. Although I am less than least of all the, of the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for the ages past was kept hidden from God, who created all things. His intent was not, uh, was that now through the church, the manifold of wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he has accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him through faith and in him we may approach God with freedom, Let's back up a minute and read that again. In him and through faith and in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Grace applied. I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you which are your glory. That scripture right there holds a lot of meat. And a lot of revelation knowledge about what grace is in our lives. Power. We're heirs. Okay. And then our grace that we apply actually affects, according to this, the heavenly realm. How does our grace affect the heavenly realm. How does it? We get what we give, is that what you said? Worship, word, what else? Outreach and impartation. Outreach and impartation. Bingo, or bam, as they say. That's good, that's a good word. Amen? All right. I do not, <coughs> it, 
the quote is in verse 9, it says, I do not at all understand the mystery of grace. Grace meets us where we are, but it does not lead us or it does not leave us where we were found. I'm going to read that again. Grace meets us where we are, but does not leave us where we were found. I know it didn't for me. Remember the story I told you earlier. I'm not the same person that I was when I first was found. I was a sinner. Messed up. Mucked up. All kinds of stuff. But grace applied. And now I'm a new creature in Jesus. Amen. Um, Rick Warren, who wrote The Purpose Driven Life, said this. He says, and you know when you've experienced grace and you feel like you've been forgiven, you're a lot more forgiving of other people and you're more gracious to others. Amen? That's pretty profound too. So one of the things that I want you to understand tonight is don't underestimate the gift of grace. Everybody in this room has it. But we have to learn to apply it. We have to learn not to take it for granted. We have to learn to apply it to others as well. Remember, there's no excuse for sin, but love the sinner. Use it to its full potential, but yet don't abuse it. Again, go back to the fact that if, if I sin and I do it over and over and over again, then I'm abusing grace, right? Amen. We have to remember, even as a church, God has chosen us to dispense grace. And we talked about that just a tad earlier, about how we can give grace to others and how that looks and what that looks like. Compassion, love, forgiveness, prayers. Right? One of the most profound statements... I heard in a sermon by John Bevere, and I don't know if you've ever been to YouTube to listen to him, but he's pretty dynamic. Um, he said this, and I want you to write this down, okay? It's just a short sentence. It's, he said in his, one of his sermons, he said, Grace empowers us to do what truth demands of us. That, my friends, not my socks off. So if we're walking and talking in the truth that Jesus gave us, truthfully, then we'll do what grace has empowered us to do. Does that make sense? Good golly molly. Good googly moogly. I'm telling you. I mean, I got short socks on tonight, but... I tell you what, when I heard that in his sermon, I thought, oh, my goodness, you've got to be kidding me. That is so profound. Did everybody get that? It empowers us to do what truth demands of us. So we have to walk it, talk it, and dispense it through the truth. As grace empowers us. Amen? Okay. Where's my helper? Oh, did everybody get a... a just check and see if everybody got a... A card? I don't think I have a card. I hope that that word... Was some some sort of revelation knowledge to you? I did a lot of digging within myself in order to get that word to you. You know, and I know that God has been moving 
in my life where grace is concerned because there's sometimes where I don't want to apply grace. Okay? And I'm standing up here as a deacon telling you that. All right? But I got pastors that probably feel the same way where someone has offended you, someone has hurt you, someone has said something to you that was sarcastic, someone has said that you were less than, someone has stated to you that you're going to hell in a handbasket because you're gay, transgendered, bi, or straight, for that matter, because you attend this church. Okay? I'm telling you that you can be saved and gay. That's not my message. My message is that we still have to apply grace because we are Christians and we're gay. Okay, you remember when you were at the park the other weekend and we had Pride Weekend? I pray that everyone applied grace because there's probably things that you saw, heard, or encountered that may not have been appropriate. Okay? But we still have to apply grace. You can play a little something soft for me if you don't mind. So what I want you to do on your card, this is kind of a corporate activation, okay? On your card, what I want you to do is ask yourself this question, all right? What is the one thing that you have not been sincere about with God where it comes to grace, when it, whether you are actively applying grace or not applying grace, what is the one thing that prevents you from walking fully in God's grace? What is the one person that prevents you from walking fully in His grace? I can't answer that for you, but I do want you to write that down. I want you to write that down. If you're good, you're good. But there's a few things that I had to write down. What is the one thing that prevents you from walking fully in God's grace? God's grace is free. But we're the ones who prevent ourselves from walking fully in the grace that God gives us. So when you write it down, I want you to come up here as an activation. Fold it. Give it to God. Tear it up. And put it right here. Okay? Yeah, come on down. I want you to... And then, and then after you do that, I want you to stay at the altar and talk to God for just a minute. I want you to thank Him for His grace. I want you to thank Him for His mercy. And thank Him for His forgiveness. And thank Him that the grace that is applied is sufficient for you and for me. I'm just going to say a prayer, and then I, I want you to just go ahead and do what you need to do before God. I want you to bring it forward and put it in the basket and just tear it up. And once you tear it up, you give it to God and don't pick it up anymore. Thank you for his grace and thank you for his mercy. Lord Jesus, we just thank you tonight that your grace is sufficient for us. That you applied the blood to every aspect of our life. And that you forgave us for the things that we've done in our past. But sometimes, Lord, as we move forward in life, things get busy. And we take things for granted. And the one thing that we don't want to take for granted tonight, Lord, is your grace. Because your grace is sufficient for us. 
it is applied in our lives each and every day. Lord, we ask right now that we have forgiveness on our hearts for those things, people, places, and things that may have hindered us from walking fully in your grace, Lord. We bring it to you tonight. We put it in the basket, and we're not going to pick it up anymore. And we thank you for it right now in Jesus' name. We thank you that you love us immeasurably. Your grace is wonderful. Your grace is, is terrific. Your grace is so loving in our lives. We just thank you, Jesus, for your grace applied to our lives each and every day. Unmerited favor that gives us the ability to walk and talk, eat and sleep, and do the things that we need to do, to do for you. Our grace affects the heavenly realms. if we apply it. So God, right tonight, we ask that we have the strength and the ability to apply grace so it will affect the heavenly realms. In Jesus' name. So we ask God that you will show us, give us visions, show us your mysteries, and tell us what it is that we need to do in order to show your grace to God's people and those people that need you the most that don't know what grace is is all about. We ask God for grace to be applied to the homeless. We ask God's grace to be applied to our community right now, God. We ask, Lord, that you use us as a vessel so that your grace can be applied, that we can be the dispenser of the grace that needs to go forward from this place from this hour to make sure that we do what is right for you.